Yeah, so what I will do now is uh, recapitulate what we did last time, okay? So that we can see the logic, hopefully, okay? So I will do this on the board, and then we will go back. This is where we stopped, okay? But uh, I will remind you where we wanted to prove and so on. Okay, so... Ah, yes, the notes, on the, web. the notes will be available on the web uh, starting next week. Eventually tonight. Well, I don't know. Yes, tonight? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but there were... I think that it just meant that we have to work all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but there's the one proof that will not be on the web because it's not typed. So, that I showed last time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's the situation is we have a solution. This is time. And this is the blow up point. Okay? And the solution remains bounded as we approach the blow up point. And now we want to prove the decomposition into sum of modulated solitons plus the um, radiation term, which is uh, just obtained by the weak limit, and uh, uh, an error that goes to zero for a properly selected sequence. Okay? So this is our aim. So the first step was the control of the flux. So uh, we, we have V, a regular solution. And by that I mean it's a solution that continues below zero. Okay? And we know that we have such a thing such that the support of U of T minus V of T is contained Okay, so that we take the weak limit of the U, we take the solution with that data at time zero going forward, and the difference will be supported in the column by finite speed of propagation. Okay? And now using the fact that this V is a regular solution, we can control the flux. Because the flux lives on the boundary of the cone, and on the boundary of the cone the solution equals the regular solution by this property. Okay? And we did this by combining Strickert's estimate with the uniform boundedness of the energy. Okay, so that was the first part. The second part was a Morawitz estimate. So basically, we looked at points at times 0 to 1 less than t2, uh, small. Oh, and we are in a situation, of course, that 0 belongs to the singular set, so that the solution cannot be continued locally beyond 0 for negative time. And we know that there's finitely many of such singular points, so we'll just concentrate near each one. Okay? So the, this uh, Morowitz estimate says that the integral between t1 and t2, the integral over x less than t of DDTU plus <coughs> uh, 
I don't know if you will see. Can you can you see what I'm writing? Okay. So and if you remember, we proved this by going to self-similar variables and uh, introducing a self-similar energy and computing a self-similar regularized energy and computing the derivative of that. Okay. So the third step is the first decomposition. So, so why is this an interesting estimate? This is an interesting estimate because the power of the log is less than 1. Right? Because if we had the power of 1, this would just be the boundedness of the term inside, which is our hypothesis. But the fact that we get better than that tells us that in some sense, in some average sense, this is going to zero. And we have this logarithmic rate at which it is going to zero, the square root of the log. Okay? So the first decomposition follows from uh, first a real variable argument. Okay, so the real variable argument, so I, let's, let me call this a Tauberian argument. I can find the sequence mu n tending to zero such that Not only that, I get an enhancement of it using a hardly litwood maximal function. So I, I can find, uh, maybe I draw a picture now here. should use some color so that you can see, but I don't have color, but it doesn't matter. Okay. So I split my interval in thirds, and in the two far out points, I can find two times T1n and T2n, such that the supremum 0 less than tau less than Tin over, I don't know, 20, some number like that, of the integral of uh, 1 over tau, tau minus tin less than uh, tau over 20, something like that, the integral over x less than t, or CT <coughs> that tends to zero for I equals one and two. So that's some <coughs> kind of improved. Uh, going to zero thing. That, and the argument to, pr to prove this is uh, using the weak type 1, 1 inequality for the maximal operator and so on. Okay? And the, the reason I can always put CT here 
is I can go to t by, by using the Morowitz identity and pass t u equals v, which is a regular solution, so that contribution is negligible. Okay? So this is what the top here. Yeah. Where is that C? Uh, For any C. Any C. Any C. Possibly bigger than one. Yes, I mean, we want to make it a 10 or something like that, okay? For any C. So the correct logic is for any C. The, uh, this is true. But the sequence does not, of times does not depend on the C. Okay? Okay, so let me see. Can people read what I'm doing in my little corner there? Okay. That's the first, that's the Taverian part. And B is that... In, in the integral in time, it's, it's what? It's T minus T and I? Mm -hmm. T, I, N. There's two times. Yeah, yeah but in the integral there. In the in which integral? It's in the it's in the integral. Yeah, yeah, in the, yeah right. So e that's it's integral over t minus t and i. Yes. Tau. Tau. And the soup is in tau. Tau is fixed. Right. So. Yeah, so I'm not understanding. You are integrating in. in, in oh. Small small integral so in, ta uh, in tau around t i n. D x d tau. Yeah. I co I conveniently didn't call it. Okay, so yes, this, yeah, it's T. Yeah, it is T. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just take the average. <coughs> and I take the supremos. Okay. So this is what my Tauberian argument gives. So that, that's essentially a real variables argument. Okay. And now I use my uh, conclusion is to, to show by analyze analysis of profiles this implies that if let me call this condition star that if star I have the decomposition with error tending to zero in L6. Okay? And so how do I do that? Well, I analyze the different possibilities of the profiles and use the inequality, I mean, use these facts. And according to the scaling of the profile, I get either a similar solution, which is ruled out by the theorem of Merle and myself, or uh, if the concentration is faster than self-similar, I can produce a traveling wave. Okay, and that gives me the decomposition, except that the error only tends to zero in L6. And now I have to work to make the error better. Then four will be the second decomposition. Okay. Now the second decomposition has two parts. The first part is the is a corollary of B. Whenever B holds, I can get a bound on L2 norms. The L2 norm goes faster than T I N to zero. Okay. 
this is in n, little o in n. So whenever I have a decomposition with an L6 error going to zero, I get this improvement. And this is a consequence of the L6 term going to zero and uh, of the flux estimates and of the known estimates for the solitary waves. Okay, so that's the first part. Now the second part, to do this question on that, remember we used the decomposition, inserted absolute values, used the triangle inequality, L2 norms we controlled either by uh, Helder's inequality or by knowing this, and then there were a term uh, and, uh, that involved the solitons, and that those by the pointwise bounds that we know on the solitons went to zero, faster than T. Yes? I can't remember, is it here? Oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> is it here they used that the time intervals were equally... Uh, no, uh, not, uh, yet. not yet. No, this, uh, you see here, the, what the correct statement here is, is whenever you have a sequence of time Tn, for which you have a, sol a, a decomposition mm -hmm. with L6 error going to zero, mm -hmm. the L2 norm has this property. Okay, so it's not a property of two times, but of <coughs> each individual <coughs> time. Okay? The second part <coughs> is the virial argument. Okay, at this point we use a virial argument. So basically what we do is we multiply the equation by u. We write zero, we integrate, uh, and uh, use the fundamental theorem and control terms. The terms at the uh, two endpoints are the TINs, and those terms we control uh, using this kind of thing. And then we have lateral terms that come from integration by parts on the lateral side, and those we control by the control of the flux. Okay? And what is the conclusion of that? The conclusion of that is that 1 over T2n minus T1n, integral between T1n and T2n, integral of x less than t of grad u squared minus dTu squared minus u to the 6. tends to zero. Okay. <coughs> okay. So we're almost there. And now we use a a second real variable argument. So I go here, see, second real variable argument. Knowing this, So let's say B <coughs> plus the mu n estimate.
This implies that I can find a time Tn in between, somewhere in here. Okay? I, I will find the time Tn somewhere in between. And let me put the two things together that I know at this Tn. This tends to zero. And now this quantity, notice that the thing I'm integrating could be negative. Okay? This is not a coercive quantity. But what I get is that the limb soup in N of the integral over x less than Tn of grad u of tn squared minus ddt u of tn squared minus uh, u to the 6 at tn dx dt is less than or equal to 0. OK? So these are the things that I do by, this is my second real variable argument. Now, I go to D, now at this sequence of time Tn's, because I have this, the first property, I can do a decomposition with L6 norm going to zero. And I also have the L2 norm going to zero, because one implies the other. Okay. Then I'm going to use two properties of, uh, of uh, the solitary waves. Question, so what's the difference between the star and this one? I'm sorry, which was the star? The star is that it's at a different point, at a different time. Yeah, yeah and here is uh, this Tn that's somewhere in between the two TIs. That's in the middle third, or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Somewhere between the two. But it's the same statement, right? It's the same statement, but at a different point. Okay? Because it's... But you cannot prove that at the same time? Just no. Because I'm going to have a second property. So the second property is... The because they... Right. The, both of them have to be hold at the same time. That, that's the point. Okay, so you use those two times to deduce another, a third time where you have the same, but you have an another property. Okay? So this is the logic. And now, if QL is a traveling wave, I know the following. Yeah. 
This is a, a consequence of the elliptic equation. And the second one is just the fact that it's a traveling wave in the direction of L. Okay? And the Li's that appear in my decomposition are the limits in N of the Ci n's over the times Tn, where this Ci n is the uh, center, where the, the traveling waves are centered at. Okay? Now with this information, I can uh, use this part to deduce that if this holds for you, once I have the soliton, the, I, once I have the soliton decomposition, it must hold also for the error, because in the soliton part I get zero. But uh, the traveling wave is not simply a Lorentz boosted. Uh, yes, that's what they are. That, that, that's the that's the proof. Don't you have this? Uh, this is the last thing. Uh, point y z point y z equals zero. D, DTQL plus L gradient QL, isn't that the point? point that's point to equal point to zero. Yes. But I'm going to use it in this way. Yes. You said the C and I or the TN that you found, <coughs> or TN. TN. This one is TN because I'm at TN now. Okay? And the I is a different thing here. Maybe I call it J. Okay? I, I forgot about the other two times now. Now that I produce my third time, I can forget about the other two. And that's information. So this tells me that the error has to verify that. Yes? Are you, that line that you're pointing at, do you mean to integrate in t also? No. This is point was in x. That's what I, uh, that's what I gained my, by my real variable arguments. Okay, oh, so yeah, you don't want DT. Oh, did I put a DT? I, I, I misspoke. Okay? Okay. So the, the, the first thing is that now this property is inherited by the error. But the error co goes to zero in L6, so I'm going to be able to take out that part. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing now is that this will be inherited also by the error because the L is essentially x over t. Okay? And because this is zero, all the terms coming from the solitary waves get killed. Okay, and so then I get to my transparency. Okay. So I get to this. The reason that the L2 term goes away is again because of the L2 norm going to zero in here. So I, I get rid of the L2, uh, of the U term. And so the offshoot of this is that I can conclude these two properties on the error. This is exactly what's inherited from this. And the other one is what's inherited from this. The u I can throw away because of the L2 property. And the other term, the, all the solitons can be taken away because of this. And I'm just left with the, um, with the epsilon. Okay. And here, since I have a supremum, if I take tau going to zero, I catch <coughs> the limit, okay? And so I have this and I have that. 
Okay, and now these are the two inequalities that will allow me to show further properties of the error. Okay? Okay, so now let's go on from these two inequalities. So is it clear how I got to those two inequalities? Okay, it's all this stuff that I wrote on the boards got me to those two inequalities. Okay, so that's been my, what I've gained so far. All right? Okay. So we have these two things. Okay. Now, here, from this, I can show that it, uh, it follows that the difference of these two L2 norms goes to zero. Right, that's a reverse triangle inequality. Okay. But the DDT, because of this, is asymptotically bigger than that. So I, I conclude that this thing, which is always non-negative because I'm integrating over x less than Tn, is less than or equal to zero by this and that. So therefore, I, I obtained this. So this is just triangle inequality to get here and combining the two estimates. Okay, now from this, since the integrand is bigger than or equal to zero now, if I go to a smaller uh, region, pick any lambda, on any region x over lambda tn will be less than lambda and so the whole gradient will tend to zero. Okay? So that tells me that if I shrink from the ball by any small amount, the energy goes to zero. So the energy, at least the spatial energy, is concentrating on the boundary. Okay? Now that implies that the tangential energy is going to zero. Why is that? Well, if I go to the integral for x less than lambda tn, this is clear. But instead of choosing a lambda, I now choose a sequence lambda n tending to 1. And the x over length of x transforms into x over tn along that sequence. And then I get from the two inequalities, I get this. Okay, this comes from this and that. All right, it, it's just the simple thing. Now, I also know that this goes to zero because of this, and therefore when x is smaller than lambda tn, this thing goes to zero, also the t, integ the t integral. So I get control of the t integral. Is that clear? And we, this is what we have to do in the next step. But to do that, we have to do a lot of work. Okay. To, to be able to show that in the whole energy you're going to zero is a whole extra step. Okay, so we have to kill the concentration on the boundary. Okay, so let me review the statement we've just proved. Okay. The claim is that there is a, a a new sequence T sub n such that we have the decomposition with an error which besides being in L6 has the tangential part of the gradient going to zero. The gradient outside always goes to zero in this decomposition because everything is localized. The, when I go a little bit inside <laughs> it goes to zero because I just proved that. The same is true for the L2 norm of the DDT. And this is the expression, 
which is in here. And that goes to zero. That was the other thing I had. And I, I've now proved this. That's what we've just proved. It's precisely this statement. Yeah, we prove all of this. So, uh, w w what were the first assumptions for the for this claim? Like the assumption is what? The assumption is that uh, we have the uniform boundedness of the H one cross L two norm as t goes to zero, which is the blow up point. And then you remove the. Then we find a, a sequence T sub m, and. A a collection of solitary waves such that uh, once I remove the regular part, the difference is the sum of the solitary waves modulated plus an error that uh, has goes to zero in this sense. Okay? And now what I want is that the error go to zero in, in energy norm. But I have to work two more steps for this, okay? Do you get any sort of like a control of how we can see No. 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 Uh, Thomas, uh, in the last uh, thing, yes, exactly here, is uh, epsilon zero or epsilon one? Uh, it's epsilon one, thank you, that's a typo. It's the DDT, yeah. It's yeah, it, it, no, 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 it's, the, it's a typo, it's a DDT. Yeah, it's what we have in here. So what is missing at this point is taking the lambda to, to be one. to one. Right. But uh, before we can do that, we have to do one extra step. The extra step is that we want to uh, show that when we apply the linear solution, that this linear solution corresponding to this data has Strickert's norm going to zero. So we need to first, before showing that it goes to zero in energy, we need to show that it goes z to zero in the dispersive sense. And after that, we have to have a new mechanism to show that I'm going to zero in energy. And that will be a new channel of energy argument. So I will uh, go uh, in the steps, okay? So the next step, and now I don't have to change my sequence of times anymore. These properties are enough to show that from this automatically follows that the linear solution uh, goes to zero in the dispersive sense. Okay? So the proof of this is very analogous to the proof of the extraction of the scattering profile that we did on Monday. In fact, it's the same ideas that go into that. So what we're going to do is do a profile decomposition on, the, on this error and show that all the profiles are zero. And that's what it means to go to zero in the dispersive sense. Okay? But I will not repeat all that because it's so similar to the thing that we've seen and details will be in the in the notes, okay? Okay, okay but what I want is there's a, a property of solutions to the linear wave equation which I, I want to discuss briefly, okay? So this is kind of a, an aside, okay? So this is a, a property of solutions to the linear wave equation with data in H1 cross L2. Then it tells you basically that the energy concentrates around the boundary of the light cone, okay? So this, uh, everybody will agree with that. Now to prove this statement when you are in uh, odd dimensions, three, I remind you, is odd, uh, you just use the strong Huygens principle. You approximate your data by compactly supported data. For the compactly supported data, you see where the solution lives, 
and then this follows automatically. Now for even dimensions this doesn't work. Okay. Now you could use th the, the radiation field that we introduced on Monday to prove this. This is an immediate consequence of the radiation field. The problem is that in our proof of the existence of this radiation field, we use this property. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Now there's another proof of this fact that follows from standard estimates on the standard uh, improved dispersive estimates on the linear wave equation that uh, are due to Dan Corner and his collaborators, the dispersive uh, estimate for solutions on of the wave equation says that if you have a, a nice initial data in 3D, let's say the gradient decays like 1 over t. Okay? But the improvement of Dan Corner and collaborators is that away from the uh, light cone, there's an improved rate of decay. And if you use that, this follows immediately also. But I don't want to use any of these proofs, I'm going to use a different proof. Why do I want to use a different proof? Because it's an introduction to what uh, the channel of energy argument is that we're going to use uh, in a few minutes. Okay? And as, I, uh, as I'm mentioning, this is only interested, interesting in even dimensions doesn't matter. I mean, we want to have a proof of these things in all dimensions. So. Okay. Anyway, I should also mention that there's another approach in the radial case using a uh, Fourier analysis that's uh, in my work with uh, Kott and Schlag. But anyway, so let's go to a proof of this. So this is a proof uh, with Dukair and Merrill. So the first point is that by density, you can assume that your da data is in C0 infinity. OK, there's nothing to say. Next, I'm going to use a virial identity to prove this. OK? And here is a virial identity that you use. And uh, of course, of course, so this is a virial identity for the linear wave equation. You prove it by integration by parts. There's nothing more here. Okay? And you can trust me that these are the right coefficients for, for this to, to hold. The linear energy has the one half. Okay? All right? Okay, so now I in integrate this between 0 and t. All right? So this is a constant, so when I integrate, I get a linear term. And then I get the two boundary terms on this thing. OK? So I just use the fundamental theorem, and that the primitive of 1 is t. OK? <coughs> okay. Now comes another important point in this and what follows. Uh, for the linear wave equation, of course, we have conservation of energy. But there's also conservation of the L2 cross H minus 1 norm, just by in integrating in space. I mean, that's... <coughs> okay. And that means, that since C0 infinity is contained in H minus 1, and uh, here it's important to have compact support. So that means that the L2 norm of the solution to the wave equation remains bounded as t goes to infinity when the, when the initial data has compact support. So you would think that it grows like t, but no, it doesn't. It remains bounded. And you can see this also directly from the formula for the solution using the cosine and the sine and so on. The H minus 1 means that you have some decay at infinity in space. Yes, and since I have a compact support, okay, so there's nothing. Okay, so using this, 
from this previous inequality, this term is controlled because the L2 norm of u is controlled, the dt u is controlled, and uh, this term is controlled, and this term is controlled. Okay? So what we get is the absolute value of this term is bigger than this. All right? So all the L2 terms are controlled by that remark, and, and the others are controlled by the energy. So that's a lower bound, and now I'm going to proceed and give it an upper bound on this. Okay? And then I'll compare. So suppose that M is the diameter of the support, and then by finite speed the support is contained in M plus T. And here this is valid in both even and odd dimensions. Okay, so I didn't cheat here, because it's the usual uh, finite speed. And let me pick an R. So I'm going to split the integral in x bigger than or equal to t minus r and x less than or equal to t minus r. When x is bigger than or equal to t minus r, I bound x by t plus m. And when x is smaller than t minus r, I bound it by t minus r. Okay? Now, yes? No relationship between r and m. No, uh, m is fixed and r uh, is a given number. Okay? Now, uh, the two t terms combine, and since I have the product and uh, the uh, h1 norm has the squares, but with the half, I can combine them into this. Okay? Okay? Now, the minus r term, again, I do, I do, okay. So let me go to the m term. In the m term, I add and subtract the part corresponding to x less than t minus r times m. The part that I added, once I use this Cauchy-Schwarz again, gives me this. The part I subtract combines with the other part to give me a minus r over 2. Okay, so I finally end up with this, and I put together both inequalities, and I get this inequality. And now I divide by r, and when I take t going to infinity and r going to infinity, this thing goes to 0. And this thing is zero by finite speed, uh, by the finite speed that I can use. So that proves my, my result. Okay? So this is a way to show that all the energy concentrates on the boundary of the cone, but I only use integration by parts. I only use variable identities for this. Okay? And this is, will be important for us. All right? Okay, so this is a, a kind of a side remark. Now let's skip all this. These things are uh, the thing that you need to rule the profiles that come from infinity. And so uh, the next claim, which I said I wasn't going to prove because it's similar to the extraction of the scattering profile that we saw on Monday, this is the next step. So in this sequence of times, we have the decomposition. The L6 norm goes to zero. We have this equality. These CJs are all strictly contained when we normalize them in, in a ball of some radius beta. This beta is a number that you should remember for later. Okay? It's somehow where all the solitons are contained. Is this also the E1, the DT? Like, is, is it here also the E1 in the L6? No, just the, the, the space norm, because that's where you control the gradient in alto. Yeah. Okay. 
but also you have these properties and in addition the dispersive norm goes to zero. Okay. So that's my statement up to now. And I just want to make one comment. Once we have this, and we couldn't do this before, we automatically have that there has to be a soliton. It couldn't be that there is no soliton. Because if there's no soliton, if the dispersive norm goes to zero by this a local Cauchy theory and the perturbation theory, the, the solution wouldn't blow up. It would exist for all time. So, but you couldn't say that until you proved that the dispersive norm goes to zero. Okay, so it could have been that in my decomposition, uh, I didn't have any solitons. So that would be really stupid, right? So, no, it's okay. J star is not zero. Right. Okay. That's the only uh, comment. I, I, we passed the proof. Okay, I'm sorry. I went too far. So now is the last step of the proof. And this is a fundamental extra ingredient. We need to kill these guys. We need to show that their energy norm goes to zero. And so far we know places where this energy norm goes to zero, but we don't know that it goes to zero everywhere. Right? It could be concentrating on the boundary of the sphere. And now we're going to uh, use an, uh, this channel of energy argument to prove that that's the case. Okay? And remember that uh, the channel of energy uh, that we used in the radial case allowed us to prove this dispersive property of, so, uh, of solutions which are not the soliton, which is what we used to prove the soliton resolution in the radial case. And we know that those things, that that uh, uh, out, outer energy lower bound fails for uh, the non-radial case. Okay, this fails, this you know, counterexample. And not only that, but in even dimensions, it al also fails in the radial case. So somehow we, ha we will produce a channel of energy that doesn't see these counterexamples. Okay? Okay. So what we will prove is a new a very simple estimate for the linear wave equation, okay? But it's an estimate that will uh, be interesting only when the data, when the, these things have some uh, good properties. So let me just, uh, let me just state the lemma first, okay? So, I give myself a pair in H1 cross L2, which is supported in the ball of radius R. Okay. And I solve the linear wave with this data. Then I'll call E0 the energy and E minus 1 the L2 cross H minus 1 energy. Okay. And I'm allowed to use this guy because I have the compact support. And these are both constant in time. So the statement is that for any eta zero between zero and r, and all t positive, there's, I can have a lower bound for the amount of energy outside x bigger than t plus eta naught for any eta naught between zero and r. Okay? And this is the bound. As the first term here, uh, another term that depends on uh, eta naught, and uh, the product of these two to the square root with a minus. Now, a priori this may be completely useless because what's on the right might be negative. Right? And this is not interesting. But we will see that we are in a good situation where that's not the case. 
Okay. But you see, this is the, of the, the type of lower bound that those outer energy inequalities uh, were giving. Okay? The advantage of this one is that it is true, while those were not, okay? in the non-radial case. Okay. So the proof of this is very similar to this uh, concentration on the boundary of the cone, and that's why I gave that one first. Okay. So the, the beginning is the same. Up to here it's the same. I, I again integrate. I get, oh, I already integrated here. I just put the terms on the other side. Now I again split the integrals into t bigger, x bigger than t plus eta naught and x less than t plus eta naught. Okay, so perhaps it's not so interesting to go through the details of this proof, but all it is is uh, basically uh, uh, the same argument as before. You just to do the accounting, and you get the lemma. Okay. So the the important thing uh, now is this statement. And what will be really important for us will be the corollary. What words are minus a zero <coughs> it's a, uh, depending on how you split. Okay. We, we use the support to get the t plus r, and then we force the eta naught this way. Okay. Okay. So the important thing is this corollary. Okay. The corollary tells me that if I have a bounded sequence which is well prepared in the sense that the energy is concentrating on the sphere, the L6 norm is going to zero, the tangential energy is going to zero, and the solution is outgoing in this sense that epsilon 1 plus DDR epsilon 0 n plus this tends to zero. If I look at the, solu uh, the solution with this data and this infimum of the H1 cross L2 norm is positive, then for any eta between zero and one, so basically the support is morally one because outside of one everything is small. Then we do have a true channel of energy. So if the data is well prepared, then the uh, amount of energy outside t plus eta naught is controlled by the total energy. And I can choose the eta naught to be anything smaller than the support. Okay? So that will be the corollary from the inequality we had before. All right. Okay, so I'll explain how the corollary falls. Okay. So the first observation is that, uh, okay, I'm going to, I don't have it exactly compact support. I only have it up to an error that goes to zero. I will force now compact support. And I, I do that by localization fix some r slightly bigger than 1 that I will choose later on, pick a cutoff function, and uh, look at the difference. The cutoff function is identically 1 in the ball of radius 1. And epsilon, the tildes 
the difference goes to zero. Okay? Because in the part outside one, there was no energy. The energy went to zero. And inside, when I take the difference, I get zero. So this is obvious. OK? All right. The next thing is that now I note that this sequence will go to zero weakly in H1 cross L2. Why does it go to zero weakly in H1 cross L2? It goes to zero weakly just because its energy is concentrated in a thin annulus. And the energy has to, then it has to go weakly to zero because when I test against the function, the contribution in a thin annulus is negligible and outside I go to zero. Okay. Now since this goes to zero weakly, it will go to zero in L2 cross H minus 1 by the Rayleigh compactness theorem. Okay? So this E minus 1 contribution will go to zero. Okay? So I'm a bit late, but this B1, you, you mean that uh, that's where you put X over T? No, B1 is the ball of radius 1. The ball in X of radius 1. In X? Yes. X. Okay, I, I, I haven't evolved. I'm just looking at the data. Okay, okay. So this is true, and this data now goes to zero in L2 cross H minus 1. And now I look at the, the corresponding uh, solution to the wave. And now I just use the lemma. I'm, I'm in, a, uh, in condition to use the lemma because the lemma just said that it had to be supported in some ball of radius, some radius, and the radius is 1. Now. And I pick a, this r bigger than 1. So this is the, exactly the statement of the lemma. that uh, I just uh, discussed. Now this term will go to zero because the e minus one goes to zero. So I get that. But remember that this data is well prepared. Okay? The data is well prepared means that the t derivative plus the ddr is almost zero. Okay? And it also means that away from the boundary of the ball of radius 1, there's no energy. So I can replace this quantity first uh, by the energy and then the, with the negative because x is pointing outside and then I get 1 minus eta naught. Remember, this is practically DDR times DDT, but DDR is practically DDT, so this is practically DDT squared, and DDT squared is one-half DDT squared plus one-half DDR squared. And that is the only energy I have because the tangential gradient was negligible. Okay? So the combination of those two things gives me that. And now I take r very close to 1 and I divide and then I get this, which is what I want. If the supremum is not 0, I can take large enough and that this is true. Okay? So all this preparation and this initial data culminates with the fact that you now have a channel of energy for it. And the basic idea of the energy channel method is that you can pass from uh, dispersively going to zero to going to zero in energy by using this method. So that's the conclusion of the proof, which I'll show now. Okay. So, of course, this has been completely linear, right? 
which is a linear lemma. Why can I use this for the nonlinear problem? And that's where the fact that the dispersive norm is going to zero comes in. If the dispersive no norm goes to zero, the linear solution and the nonlinear solution are close to each other. And that's just the local theory of the Cauchy problem and the, its perturbation. Okay? <coughs> and that's why it was important to prove that the dispersive norm is going to zero. So that's the step that allows you to pass from linear to nonlinear. Okay? Okay, so now is the conclusion of the proof. Okay, so we're near the end. <laughs> okay, so suppose by contradiction that for some subsequence this doesn't go to zero, so it's bounded from below. Okay, now I have to rescale by t sub n my previous inequalities. Okay, but that's a standard and immediate. And once I rescale, what I have, this is my channel of energy. Now instead of eta naught, I have eta naught times t sub n. And I have bigger than eta naught. And because this is uniformly bounded uh, for some subsequence, I have the mu naught and I don't know why I put 8, I could have put 4, okay. And this is going to be true for any eta naught in 0, 1. So now I'm going to tell you how I will choose the eta naught. Okay. Remember that we had in, in, our, in our decomposition, we had a number beta, which indicated how uh, in how much inside the ball the solitons are, okay? Right, the beta was an upper bound on these numbers, okay? The eta naught will be chosen slightly bigger than this beta, but still less than one. And what's the effect of that? The effect of that is that for x bigger than eta naught, you don't see the solitons because of their concentration. Okay? You have a uniform bound on the edges. Yes, because that's a given by the energy. Uh, when the energy of the soliton tends to infinity as L tends to 1. Uh, the, the, okay? So that, that is crucial. Is absolutely essential for this argument, but we this is okay. All right. Okay. So I now define w zero n plus comma w one n to be the radiation term plus the error. That's that is my solution where I forgot the solitons. Okay. Now, since this eta naught is bigger than beta, the difference between u and this guy outside is small, because the solitons are negligible in this region. So that's why we need to have this outer energy information for any eta naught, because we don't know where the solitons are going to be. Okay. And now I look at the solution of the nonlinear wave equation. Uh, These uh, things just have to do with staying away from the other singular points. So let's ignore them. Okay. Now we know that the uh, dispersive norm of this is going to zero. So the approximation theorem gives us an expansion for the solution with this data. It tells us that it's the V, the solution for that, plus the epsilon, the linear solution for these things, because the 
since the dispersive norm goes to zero, the linear and the nonlinear norm uh, solutions are close to each other, and an error which becomes small. Okay. And it becomes small not just in the dispersive sense, but even in the energy. Right? That's the approximation theory. Now, because of this inequality initially, and finite speed of propagation, this inequality propagates in time, and what we get is that u is close to w in uh, x bigger than t minus tn plus eta naught tn. That's what finite speed of propagation does. When t equals tn, this is eta zero tn, which is this. So, And this delta is smaller than this r naught. It's just some small parameter here. That doesn't play much of a role, it just is separating the di different uh, singular points. So we have this decomposition for Wn. We have a channel property for epsilon L. And then Wn, because of this decomposition, this guy is small. This is a regular solution, so on small sets its contribution is small. And this is the thing that has the channel, so that means that W inherits the channel. And this is what I get. Now I can put T here, by, again by uh, the concentration property of epsilon 0, epsilon 1, they are in the, in the ball of radius T sub n and finite speed of propagation, so that grows like t. The rest is negligible. So I have that. But in this region, this guy is almost u. So I can replace it by u, paying a small price. And the small price is that I went from 1 over 16 to 1 over 32. Okay? And this is valid for all t's in this range. Okay? Now I apply this at delta over 2. So I get this. But notice that when tn goes to 0, this region disappears. And this is a regular, because it's time delta over 2, is away from the singular time. This is a regular function in the energy norm. So how could its integral over nothing be positive? This is what the channel of energy argument does. So this is the contradiction to the fact that the epsilon ends had a lower bound. So the epsilon ends couldn't have had a lower bound, so they go to zero. And if you remember, in the other channel of energy arguments we've seen, there's something that happens for either positive time or negative time. Here we don't need that because we have uh, outgoing data. So the flow of time is always forward. Okay. And this concludes the proof. So this is the last step. So in this part, in, I mean, this last part, yes. you never use that you have a special at the end, you just use the... Well, that I had a decomposition with an error having certain properties. I have to use all you the properties. I have to use all the properties of the error that I've had uh, up to now. Even in this thing, the class? Yes, because the... the Otherwise, I don't. Uh, otherwise, I don't know this lower bound, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because the, in the general result, the right-hand side could be negative, except that for this particularly well-massaged uh, sequence, I, I have a good control in this way. Okay, so. Uh, one could conclude from this that this is a, a correct approach to this problem, right? Because everything matches. So, just sort of in the same line. Yeah. So, if you had 
you had a, a theorem which says you have this epsilon which on a sequence of time satisfies all of these things. So whatever strength you have that result for, you get the full result. Well, you need a certain amount of results because uh, so you need all of, the, all of these things come in different, in different places and showing that from... So it's on like page 81, you had a list of properties. Right. And, and so those lists of properties are necessary to show that this thing has a lower bound, first thing. Th there you don't need the dispersive property that the is going to zero. But you need the dispersive property to pass from linear to nonlinear. Okay? Okay? So I know that this is a somewhat uh, convoluted, maybe not the easiest, easiest thing to absorb, but I hope at least I gave you some feeling for how this uh, proof goes. But, uh, before uh, asking for more questions, I just want to make a few comments. Okay. Um, so we've proven this decomposition. But you could ask first, is, uh, do you really need all these solitons in such a decomposition? Okay, maybe you only need one. This is a question that many people ask. A and it turns out that you need more than one. And uh, as t goes to infinity, this was uh, proven in a paper of Martel and Merle uh, in dimension 5. You have multi-solitons appearing in the asymptotics as time goes to infinity. Okay. The reason for dimension 5 is that this, uh, uh, what's very important is the fatness of the tails of, of, the, of the solitons. And the higher the dimension, the less fat they are. And that's why their argument works in dimension 5. Now, in the finite time blow up, it still uh, uh, hasn't been proven, as far as I know. Jacek is here, where is Jacek? Hasn't been proven that the you need, that there are solutions with two bubbles that have finite time blow up. But uh, I believe that this is uh, within the reach of the techniques developed by Jacek Gendrej in his thesis that will be defended on Monday at the Polytechnique. Um, then there's the question of passing to other sequences of times, right, instead of one. And I already said something about that, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, this uh, is a, a difficult problem. It has to do with how multi-solitons collide. And uh, it will take some time to understand. Okay, so this is all I want to say about that again. Uh, then, how specific is this to this problem? Okay, so this is something else to understand. Of course, I mean, for this problem, all of this worked as if it was made for it, right? Uh, well, I think that for other nonlinear wave equations, maybe geometric wave equations, this approach should also uh, apply. So for wave maps, for example, for critical wave maps, I believe that this will work. Hopefully, eventually, also for the wave version of Young Mills uh, at some point. Okay. Then, uh, what happens without finite speed of propagation? Okay, so, in Schrodinger cases or correct debris cases or things of that type, I think this is a, a really good direction for the future. I don't want to say more than that. But I think that, uh, you know, this shows that things like that can be done. So, one should have the courage to, to think about those problems. Okay, and now let me see, I have one more slide. Thank you, Frank, but I...
That's the, <laughs> that's the final slide. And I, I really appreciate the interest and the sustained attention over many lectures. So thank you. Yes, questions or comments? Or oh, can we in fact, more general questions oh, uh, related uh, to <coughs> You explained me this before, so I'm just don't remember that you use that for Klein Gordon, you see that as an intermediate thing between the Schrodinger and the... Yeah, I think in some sense that that is the case, because for small frequencies... Change the scaling there. Right. Right. Should I have more words? Well, and I have no results okay. for yeah, Klein Gordon. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have no voice, I have no results, so it's no, okay. No, no. <laughs> for Klein Gordon. Yeah. <coughs> um, I'm sorry. Other questions? Uh, or comments, or uh, 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 question uh, about directions uh, yeah. for the long term? Very, very long term. Very long term. <laughs> well, I think I discussed a little bit of, of that, uh, but. Uh, any other question is welcome. Yes. What would survive in, the, in subcritical situations? Well, uh, so far nothing. <laughs> you, you really need the, the, the scaling? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, we, we, this is... Uh, yeah. That I, of course, that's an important question. It's a, another, you know, important future direction. There, the Klein Gordon. Yeah. With Klein Gordon, you can have uh, you, you still have an approximate scaling for high frequencies. Right, you but use uh, it for low frequencies. Mm -hmm. Maybe with some cutoff, you could. Uh, but uh, I don't know. It's difficult to understand what replaces uh, the energy channels in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, the outer energy inequalities are all false. So in here, even if you add like a lower order term, I don't know how to do that. Uh, what do you think, Frank? I don't know. Uh, oh, okay, but you have to be careful on the lower order term. You need uh, to, uh, the problem to be interesting has to be uh, you need solitons. Yes, you need to have solitons, right? I mean. uh, so if you just make sub subcritical, uh, there is no soliton right, right. of the equation. No, that's why you need to have two. You need to have two terms, so that you have. La question of you, because you p, p subcritical, no, no solito. Uh, okay, so you, then you have to cook up something, and I guess. Uh, no, there are. Yes. Is a more natural it's a natural uh, example for that. So then you have many examples, many problems, <laughs> which appears. Yeah, many many problems. But of course, that's good because there's more work to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to do something that finishes things off more. It's better to start things off. Um, okay, Co other comments, remarks? Uh, if not, let's thank uh, the speaker again for all the series of lectures. Yes. Yes.